Mark Rosengarten. Welcome to... Ask Rosengarten. Hello and welcome back to Ask Rosengarten, the show where you ask the questions and I answer them. I'm sorry I've been away for a couple of days. We've had a crazy week, what with the state exams, but that's all over now. So I'm back and I'm ready to answer your questions. So here we go. Our first question today comes from Sweet Hippie Michelle on YouTube, and it's about significant figures. The question is this, how many significant figures can you find in these two numbers? Well, actually, significant figures are not that hard to figure out. What a significant figure is, it's a digit that you've actually measured during the process of experimentation, collecting data. Every digit you write down is a significant figure, except for place holding zeros. Now, a lot of times people don't know where the place holding zeros are, but there's only one or two places that a place holding zero can be either immediately before the decimal point or immediately after the decimal point. Any zeros that are anywhere else, well, they're not placeholding zeros. Let me show you what I mean. In this first number right here, every digit that's written down is a significant figure. There are no placeholding zeros. You might say, well, what about that zero right there? That's not a placeholding zero. These are placeholding zeros. You see, we don't know what exactly it is that comes after that four. This could be 4,112. We don't know. It could be 3,956. We don't know. We've just rounded the answer up to the nearest thousand. In this number here, you don't measure the tens place and the thousands place without also having measured the hundreds place. This is a significant figure. This is a significant figure. These are not. Now in this bottom number right here, if you've got a zero in front of a number that's bigger than one, you don't need to have that zero there. Okay, it's not even a placeholder because it's not really holding anybody's place. Now what actually got this question asked was my music video, Big Sig Fig Gig. And in there, the rule that I give is, bigger than one with a decimal point, they're all sig figs. Bigger than one with a decimal point, they're all sig figs. It's a good rule of thumb. If your number is one or larger, if you've got numbers on both sides of the decimal point like we have here, well, you know, that's going to be, uh, all of them are going to be significant figures. Even if I did this, 4,000.0, aha! That zero was a measured zero. Bigger than one with a decimal point, they're all sig figs. Because we now know that the answer is 4,000 all the way down to the tenths place. So there's five sig figs in that number. See what a difference this makes? Without the point zero, there's only one sig fig. With the point zero, there's now five sig figs. Here, we had absolutely no idea what came after this four. So we popped place. I can't believe it took that long to get to the mall. Woo! Oh, we know that the measurement is exactly 4,000 right down to the tenths place. It's kind of like if you're driving down the road in your car and your uh, car's odometer is 3,999.8, 3,999.9. Wait for it, here it comes, because we all know we get excited when that odometer turns over. 4,000.0, yes, we drove exactly 4,000.0 miles, woo! The next question comes from JackSucker7 on YouTube, and it's, how would you draw HSO4- as a covalent bond dot diagram? The sulfate ion has the following structure. Now, if you follow the normal rules and replace each of your dashes with two dots, and then fill in your stable octets for the oxygen, You have the dot diagram of the sulfate ion. Now you have some resonance going on where this double bond switches back and forth between these two pairs of oxygens. So how does hydrogen enter the mix? Easy. This coordinate covalent bonded with one of the oxygens. There goes the hydrogen. Now because you've added H plus to this, notice that the hydrogen didn't contribute any electrons to this bonded pair. The oxygen provided both of the bonded electrons. So the hydrogen that came in was H plus. 
Now, because the whole ion was originally minus 2, adding the H plus makes this whole ion minus 1. The hydrogen sulfate ion. Gaze upon it in all its glory. I love polyatomic ions, don't you? When they bond to metals, the bond that they form with the metal is an ionic bond. And yet, because of the shared electrons that make up the polyatomic ion, the polyatomic ion itself is formed from covalent bonds. So any compound made from a polyatomic ion and a metal, a ternary compound, is going to contain both ionic bonds and it's going to contain covalent bonds. It's both giving and taking and sharing all at the same time. And the last question for today comes from Maggie Skinner. She would like some help in converting between cubic units. For example, cubic decimeter to cubic meter to cubic centimeter, okay? So how do you deal with conversions of cubic units? Well, Actually, it's not that much different from converting from regular metric units. Okay, so this question is asking us to convert from cubic nanometers, which is an incredibly tiny amount of volume, and cubic decimeters, which is exactly the same volume as a liter. The first thing you need to do is find out what the distance is between the factor of nano and the factor of deci. See, now nano is 10 to the negative ninth meters. And deci is 10 to the negative first meters, a billionth of a meter and a tenth of a meter. Now what we're doing is when you're dealing with volume, you're dealing with cubic distance. For example, here we have a nanometer and here we have another nanometer and here we have a third nanometer. So we actually have three dimensions that we have to deal with nanometer in length, nanometer in width, and nanometer in height. So this, finding the difference between the two factors is going to be our first step. And then we're going to have to cube it to account for the fact that there are three dimensions that we're dealing with here. So there's eight powers of 10 difference between nanometer and decimeter. That's 10 to the eighth. Did I just write 18 to the zero? I said 10 to the eighth. My hand is not listening to my, my brain. There are eight powers of 10 difference between 10 to the negative ninth and 10 to the negative first. That's a 10 to the eighth difference between nanometers and decimeters. But we have to cube that because we have three dimensions, nanometers, nanometers, and nanometers. Na, 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 na. Now, when we cube this, what we're going to do is, because when you multiply numbers with exponents together, you add the exponents together. So in order to cube this, what we need to do is multiply the exponent by three. Difference is 10 to the eighth times the three dimensions that we're working in. This comes out to a 10 to the 24th difference between cubic nanometers and cubic decimeters. So let's solve our problem. There are 10 to the 24th cubic nanometers in a cubic decimeter. And we have 5,131.45 cubic nanometers. Now, cubic nanometers are here. It's in the numerator of our conversion factor, so we have to divide to get our answer. For this, I'd recommend using a scientific calculator because you're not going to be able to fit this in your typical four-function calculator. So we go 5,131.45 divided by 1. Now I'm going to look for the EE or EXP button on this calculator. Times 10 to the 24th. And that comes out to 5. 0.13145, keeping all of my significant figures. And that would be times 10 to the negative 21st cubic decimeters. So if you were just trying to convert nanometers to decimeters, you would divide by 10 to the eighth because that's the difference between a nanometer and a decimeter. But because you're dealing with cubic volume, you have to multiply that exponent by the number of dimensions that you're dealing with. We're dealing with three dimensions, length, width, and height. So we multiply that exponent by the number of dimensions that we're dealing with. And that gives us the conversion factor we need to solve the problem.
The second half of this problem is to convert this into microliters. Well, it just turns out that we're really, really fortunate because a cubic decimeter is the same as a liter. So instead of cubic decimeter, I'm going to put the unit liter in because a cubic decimeter is a liter. If you take a cube that is one decimeter on each side, that cube can hold one liter worth of volume. So I am totally justified in taking cubic decimeter and replacing it with liter. Now the question says we need to convert that to microliters. That's great because now we're not dealing with any extra dimensions. We can convert like unit to like unit. You see, there's no cubes, there's no anything. It's just liters to microliters. It's just a straight conversion. So liters is 10 to the zeroth because it's got no prefix to it. Microliters is 10 to the negative sixth. It's a millionth of a liter. So the difference between them is 10 to the sixth. And unlike before, when we were dealing with cubic dimension, we're just dealing with flat one dimensional analysis right here. So we don't have to multiply that 10 to the sixth by anything. So that's perfect. So that's 5.13145 liters. And we have 10 to the sixth. And that would be in microliters per liter. So that liters cancel out, we multiply. So this is easy. I mean, five times a million is five million, right? And 131,450 microliters. And there you go. Now that the new semester is starting and I got things pretty well in hand, I'll be able to do this on a more frequent basis. This past week has just been a little bit on the insane side. So if you have a question about chemistry, particularly high school chemistry, and need to know the answer to it, just give me an email at askrosengarten at gmail.com and I'll do what I can to get to your question. So what are you waiting for? Ask Rosengarten.